All right, well, thanks for having me, and I'm, it's always a pleasure to come to the Deep 15Q meeting. And um, I have to say, I enjoyed the mouse talks today. Um, I'm no longer in the, the mouse business, but um, it's good that we have a variety of models. And I'm gonna talk to you today about one that uh, you haven't heard about, which is a Drosophila model that we've recently developed uh, to recapitulate the seizure phenotype in um, Dupe 15 q syndrome. Um, okay, so we've all seen this slide in a couple different iterations today, but unfortunately we have to go over a few things once again. Um, and that is, I just wanna remind you that there's a critical region between breakpoints one and uh, breakpoints two and three, um, and located in this region that's duplicated in Dupe 15 q syndrome and deleted in both Prater Willi and Angelman syndrome, are a series of, of genes that undergo allele specific expression in neurons. Specifically, there's a set of paternally expressed genes um, and at least one or more of those is involved in the phenotype in Prater Willi syndrome. And then there's essentially a single maternally expressed gene, UB3A, that we've talked about quite a bit today. Uh, now that isn't to say that there aren't other genes in the region. And in fact, um, the phenotypes vary in people who have uh, do, uh, at least deletions of um, either just the critical region versus a larger deletion, and the phenotypes vary in duplications across this region. And the UPD cases um, are, have a slightly different phenotype in Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome than the cases that are deletion cases. So this implies that it's not just the one gene that is responsible for the entire phenotype, um, but that there, there certainly is one gene driving the majority of the phenotype. Um, and I would encourage you tomorrow to go to Kevin's talk where he's gonna talk about this um, HERC2 gene and the interaction between HERC2 and UB3A. And both of those genes are, um, both of those genes are duplicated in the critical breakpoint 2-3 region. Okay, so uh, we did a study a few years ago where we, um, we looked at just interstitial duplication 15Q, and we had, in this particular study, we looked at 14 individuals who all had interstitial duplications that encompassed the breakpoint 2-3 region, and with the help of Ron Thiebert, we identified an increased beta activity uh, in the waking record in these kids that seemed to look like uh, they were on uh, GABA-promoting drugs, benzodiazepines, but they were not. Um, this work was then followed up by Shafali Jest and um, using high-density high, uh, EEG, uh, she got really beautiful results in both interstitials and IDEX that shows this really increased um, beta activity throughout the brain, and this this activity was not detected in the ASD sample she looked at and in the typically developing individuals, and it may turn out to be a really strong biomarker uh, for this particular syndrome. I think it's also appropriate to bring up um, that when, you, uh, when the Alliance actually did a survey of uh, drugs that were effective in treating uh, seizure in these individuals, that they found that parents reported over and over again that this particular class of drugs, that benzodiazepines were relatively ineffective in actually suppressing seizure, um, which seems to imply that there's already elevated GABA in the brain. Um, now, all of this speaks to GABA, and it speaks to the possibility of GABA somehow being involved, and there's a cluster of GABA receptors in the region uh, that's also duplicated. And so I think there's been a lot of hand-waving about the GABA receptors being the primary driver of seizure phenotypes in DUP15Q. Um, I personally have, have never found any evidence, and Janine and I have published a paper where we didn't really find increases in GABA in postmortem brain, and it just looked like GABA is there, but, you know, these GABA receptors are there, but they may not really be the cause of the seizure phenotype. So, in my lab, we actually use a couple different approaches. Um, so I, I uh, briefly spoke about the, the study of the uh, interstitial dupe kids, and we also have ongoing studies, um, which is the reason I'm called the tooth fairy, 
because we take teeth from uh, kids with a variety of neurogenetic disorders and we grow stem cells from them. Um, and that's what I usually talk about at this meeting. But we have a very nice, complete story um, related to seizures in the syndrome, and that actually is a fly story. Uh, so I'm going to tell you today about seizures in flies and about the mechanism that we think is underlying seizures, not only in these flies, but also in people with dupe 15 q And we haven't quite gotten to the people part, but we're aiming in that direction. And maybe some of you mouse people, by the end of my talk, will take your really nice mouse models and you will do some experiments similar to the ones we did in flies and validate some of these results in mammals. So the first question is, um, do flies have seizures? Thankfully, I did not have to answer this question myself. This has been known for some time. Flies definitely do have seizures, and they undergo a seizure um, process that's very similar to what happens in, in humans. Um, and also, you can, you can make these seizures occur using a variety of methods. Mostly, uh, the papers focus on particular genes involved in, in seizure um, that when you knock them out, the flies are now susceptible to seizure. And the way you assay that is you actually bang the vial and the flies fall to the bottom of the vial and have a seizure. When, when we do the actual assay, um, we, we take the flies and we put them on a vortexer. So it's like the worst car accident in the world. And they beat around for about 30 seconds. And if you do this to a normal fly, they get right back up and ask for more. They don't care. They get right back up, they climb right up the vial. But the flies that are susceptible to seizure will fall to the ground, lay there, then have a seizure, then lay there again, and then have a recovery seizure, finally, if they live and climb, right? So uh, you can actually measure that over time, and you can measure the number of flies that are recovering over time, and you get these curves that represent the, uh, the recovery time uh, related to that particular seizure phenotype. So I want you to keep this in mind, because I'm going to backtrack just a little bit and actually talk about something that um, has, has actually been talked about in little pieces in a variety of papers, but I don't think has really been emphasized before. And that is, you know, the brain is made up of glia and neurons. And in fact, again, thankfully, I didn't have to make this stuff up. The papers are already there. So let me walk you through a couple uh, points that will hopefully uh, make it clear that ube 3 is biallelically expressed in mammals in glial cells. If you look at this first publication from 2003, you can see that when you culture neurons and culture glia from ube 3 um, uh, deficient mice, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's maternal or paternal deficiency, um, you see in the, the cultured glia, you do not see an antisense transcript at all. And we didn't talk much about that at this meeting, but the antisense transcript is essentially regulating the expression of ub 3 And so if you don't see it there, there's a good chance ub 3 is being expressed. But let's move on to actual uh, immunohistochemistry. And if you look in the ub 3 deficient um, mouse and you look in the brain for GFAP positive cells, you can see that the GFAP positive cells are also positive for UB3 in the, in the UB3 deficient animal. And finally, uh, Scott, who unfortunately is not here today, recently published a paper where he used his YFP uh, tag on UB3, and you can clearly see that GFAP positive cells are expressing plenty of this YFP positive uh, UB3 tag, whether it's inherited maternally or inherited paternally. So the message here is, in mammals, in the mouse brain, ub 3 is biallelically expressed in glial cells. That's the starting point for the fly work that I want to talk about. Okay, okay so again, I, I'm never sure how many people know anything about flies, so I'm going to go over this, and excuse me if you already know this stuff, but I have to do it because you won't understand how we did the experiments if I don't. So in flies, we can take um, mobile elements and we can insert them in the genome very easily. And what we use is we've stolen a system from yeast 
that involves the upstream activator system, uh, up, upstream activator sequence. Then we put a cDNA of interest and a selectable marker on this transposon, and the marker is typically eye color, so you see red-eyed flies that come out. And what we do is we, we use that in combination with uh, a GAL4 line, so we, we use another P element that lands somewhere in the genome, and it steals the local enhancers to drive expression of GAL4, so it drives that GAL4 protein in whatever pattern would normally be driven by the elements in that region. And that could be in the head, the eye, the wing, it can be temporal, it can be thousands of GAL4 lines that you can order from the stock center tomorrow and they come to your door in a couple days. So we have the, the flexibility here to answer some questions. And the way this works is the GAL4 protein binds to the upstream activator sequence and drives expression of your particular cDNA. In this case, it would uh, drive expression in glial cells. And there's, in fact, several glial drivers. I'm going to talk about a few of them. Um, we're working on several more of them, but the, the main driver I'm going to talk about is called RepoGal4, and it expresses in all glial cells in the adult and developing fly. Okay, so I, I promised that I would talk about seizures in flies, and this is that same picture. And these flies on the left, um, these are RepoGal4 crossed to wild-type flies, so they should have no effect. And these flies on the right are RepoGal4 driving uh, wild-type Drosophila UB3. If you watch, we've already done the vortexing, and if you watch the fly on the right side, you should see some motion. You see the one on the left side, He's fine already, he doesn't care. But this one, there he goes. This one's gonna have a little seizure. And then he's gonna be paralyzed again. And then he'll have another seizure. And I think at the end of the video, he starts to crawl away. You can actually measure these seizures um, using electrodes in the flight muscle. Um, you can do other ways to measure it, but this is just kind of a, an easy way to assess whether the fly is having a seizure or not that you can quantify. Okay, so um, the first set of experiments really was, you know, well, everybody works on overexpression of UB3 in neurons, so we should do that. We've done it before. We've, we've looked at um, proteins that are regulated by UB3 in neurons. And when we express UB3 in neurons using ELAV, which is a pan-neural driver, we don't see an effect. There's, there's no seizure. When we use an early um, glial driver, in, in fact, which I don't know if that data is on here, uh, called GCM, we also don't see an effect. So repo comes on later. And when we use the Drosophila UB3 C to A mutation, which is at the active site, so the ubiquitin ligase function is gone, we also don't see an effect. The only line you see here, so all the other lines are up here, they're 100% recovered after the vortex. The only line you see is repo driving wild type UB3, which as you can see, in this particular case, it takes about 30 seconds for flies to even start to recover, right? And then over time, they do recover, but it takes them a while. We then looked developmentally um, in a short window after the flies came out of their pupil cases, and you can see that this effect, and this is an important point, is not at its strongest right after a closure. So the flies that are zero to two days old you know, maybe about 50% of the flies have seizures. That's really important because it means it's not fixed developmentally, it's accumulating over time as the flies get older, so the three to six day old flies, and then as they get much older, seven to 10 days, they actually have seizures and they die. So something is ongoing after a closure. It's not fixed right at birth, it's actually developing over time. We repeated these experiments using, and I have to be specific because we keep talking about isoforms, human isoform two, which I think is mouse three. Yes, okay. So using human isoform two, we, we overexpress human isoform two in glial cells, and we actually see a seizure phenotype. So we're able to recapitulate this in flies with human UB3. Okay, so what, what's going on at the molecular level? What is UB3 doing in glial cells? and um, what could the target be? Well, we actually already had an idea what the target might be because we've done a, a large-scale 
proteomic screen a couple of years ago, and we identified a protein um, that is a sodium-potassium exchanger that's called ATP-alpha that we showed was ubiquitinated in a UB3A-dependent manner, and we pulled out initially in our proteomic screen. It has a very nice homologue in mammals, and it looks like this particular protein is regulated in vivo in neurons by UB3A. So we wanted to see, okay, well, if it's regulated by UB3A, there's some things we could do. We had some nice reagents. We, we wanted to see if it's expressed in the same cell types in the brain, and so also if it's expressed in glial cells, that would help, right? So we did some immuno, and this is all Kevin's work that's in a paper that's, um, that's in review right now. Uh, so the first experiment was to look at repo staining. So repo is the driver I was talking about, and this is an antibody against repo. So these are glial cells. And if you look, UB3A antibody, this is a validated UB3A antibody that was published years ago. That's uh, a fly antibody. That it overlaps perfectly in these cells, but also is expressed in other cells. And, and the reason for that is repo is actually a transcription factor. So um, it's only going to show staining in the nucleus, but there's actually staining all out here as well for UB3A, which we expected. Um, when we look at ATP alpha, we used a, a GFP ATP alpha fusion line that we had, and so you can see the ATP alpha here, and you can see UB3A here, and if you maybe can see uh, where the arrow is pointing, in general, you can see a yellow color to this particular panel. Um, this is actually a very strong co-localization of ATP alpha and UB3A in the brain. So we were able to see it. It overlaps with UB3A, so they're in the same cell types. And in fact, when we do Western blots, um, quantitative Western blots in this case, we can actually confirm that ATP alpha levels go down when UB3A is overexpressed. So um, we tried a few other things. Uh, to validate this interaction between uh, UB3A and ATP alpha in fly heads. And when we look again at, um, uh, I think, the C-A construct here, you see repo alone or repo driving UB3A, C-A, ATP alpha levels are not affected. That means that ATP alpha is being ubiquitinated by UB3A. It's the ubiquitin function that's essential for changing the ATP alpha levels. And also, human UB3A uh, is able to decrease levels of ATP alpha, of fly ATP alpha. And then finally, we, there's a couple of uh, rescue experiments on here. So uh, again, repo driving UB3A decreases ATP alpha. And then if you, if you also express wild type ATP alpha at the same time, you can, you can pump those levels up a little bit. So you can rescue the protein level decreases just a bit. That's important because um, if you look at the recovery, we can actually um, de decrease the recovery time by co-expressing wild-type ATP alpha, right? So repo driving UB3A causes the flies to have seizures, takes them a while to recover. When we co-express wild-type ATP alpha, the flies now have a decreased recovery time, so we're rescuing most but not all of the phenotype. That's an important point because there could be other substrates. I'm not claiming this is the only one, but it's a very strong one for the seizure phenotype. Uh, we can actually get flies to um, have seizures uh, or have worse seizures when we add a ATP alpha inhibitor, Wabane. So if we add 10 millimolar Wabane, these are flies that are expressing UB3A. These are flies expressing UB3A and treated with Wabane. It takes them much longer to recover. That means ATP alpha function, so whatever little ATP alpha is left, if you inhibit it, it now causes that seizure phenotype. And then finally, uh, when we overexpress an RNAi for ATP alpha, flies have seizures. So that's, that's all consistent with uh, UB3A regulating ATP alpha and ATP alpha being a key player in the seizure phenotype. Um, I'm not looking at the mutants at all. I'm ex overexpressing UB3. Yeah, no, Matt, you've done that Oh, if we've done it? The experiment we did in 2013 was we did a ubiqu we used a ubiquitin column and we looked in the homozygous mutants, which we can make homozygotes, um, and we saw a huge decrease in the amount of ubiquitinated ATP alpha. We didn't look at levels. 
we looked at the amount of ubiquinone at HB alpha. Does that make sense? So we haven't done that specific experiment. Okay, so we did some RNA-seq analysis, uh, so we could dig a little deeper into this and figure out what's going on in the rest of the brain as a result of UV3 overexpression in glia. Um, specifically, we were really interested in this subset of, uh, of transcripts that change just when we overexpress UB3 in glial cells. It's very glial cell specific, not the shared transcripts that change when we also express in neurons. So we looked at this data set and we found something really interesting. Um, when you overexpress UB3 in glia, you see a decrease for a whole list of really classic synapse-associated proteins. And those include some of your, your favorite hits, uh, like Brush Pilot and uh, SAP47 and RDL and ACE. And, and, you know, you can look all these guys up. They all have homologs in humans. They're all essential synaptic proteins. And there's a whole lot of them that get downregulated when we express in glia but not neurons. And these are neuronal proteins. So that was really interesting to us. Could you, could these, uh, at least in the brain of you know, mammals, uh, there's a phase of the radial glia that turns in, it becomes sort of a source of neurons during neuro, neuro, neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a possibility that you're hitting more than just glia here? Well, when we do the RNA-seq analysis, we're hitting more than just glia. We're, we're taking the whole brain. So we can't distinguish that. Um, well, you know, No, no, the driver is very specific for glial cells, and to my knowledge, that particular characteristic is not occurring in the adult, for sure, and it's very late development that repo comes on, so I don't think that that's what's happening. I can't prove it one way or the other. However, we have five different glial subtype drivers that I have a student testing right now, and so we're going to refine this down to a subset of glial drivers, hopefully, that will eliminate some of the issues with using all glial cells, which is kind of a sledgehammer approach. Ben looks like he wants to ask a question. <laughs> yes. No, I think my lack of knowledge of okay. and drivers, but are the drivers for the different cell types, do they drive at a similar level, or are there different levels? No, that's a good question. Um, so you get what you get. So they're stealing the, the local enhancer. So they're expressing at the level of the gene they landed in or near. Okay, so that's good, but you can manipulate their expression level by temperature. So we do sometimes do experiments at higher temperatures and lower temperatures to actually get flies to come out. Um, but as far as like, are they all equal? They're not all equal, right? Because they're, they come from different initial landings of P elements near genes. Yeah. Okay, there's been a, a push to normalize some of that stuff and our experience with it has been great. Um, and, you know, one way to get around it is, like you said, doing different lines and yeah. the same thing in different lines. Right. And that's encouraging. Well, yeah, we want to find a subset of glia, so we can, we can express in perineural glia, we can exp express in ensheathing glia, we can express in, um, you know, these uh, cortical glia, they call them. So we, we're doing that now. So we have the collection and we're, we're trying to figure this out. Three minutes. All right, I'm going to skip over the electrophys stuff because that always makes me nervous anyway. So um, let's talk about the model a little bit because this is sort of the home run. So um, what, what we came up with essentially is that there's something about HP alpha, which is a sodium potassium exchanger, um, and changing the amount of that particular protein in glia is having an effect on neurons, right? So what we think is going on is that HP alpha is regulating potassium levels in this uh, synaptic space, and that if you, if you decrease the levels of ATP alpha by overexpressing UB3 in glial cells, you should get an increase in potassium levels, which would cause um, both presynaptic and postsynaptic defects that are going to cause the flies to have uh, seizure susceptibility. So, uh, Kevin and I went back and forth about this a couple times because he, he wanted to call this paper, you know, potassium homeostasis, right? And I kept saying, well, we didn't really show potassium. Like, we showed so uh, HP alpha, but we never really looked at potassium. So we talked about it. We figured out an approach. And Kevin did these really nice experiments where he found this dye 
that is actually a, a potassium binding dye that's fluorescent. And you can see the D tomato is just a marker of where the dye is being expressed. And then the green signal is potassium bound um, APG, APG2. And so we saw a clear decrease in the signal in glial cells for potassium when we overexpress UB3A. So we overexpress UB3A in glia using this this green dye and the green signal goes down indicating that there is less potassium inside the glial cells. So that is an actual physical assay of potassium in vivo. So we're pretty confident that this is the right model um, and we think we've kind of proven a couple ways to Sunday that at least ATP alpha is somehow involved in this phenotype. Um, so in the last minute that I have, I was going to talk about a recent R21 that we got um, and we've got some people diligently screening right now. Uh, so before Kevin's paper came out, we wrote this R21 to use it as a screening tool to look uh, through FDA approved libraries to find, um, to repurpose drugs that could possibly suppress the seizure phenotype in this model. And we started with this library called the Presswick Library that some of you might know. Uh, we actually have a natural product library as well. And we're doing about, well, we started with 80 uh, compounds a week, but now we're ramping up and we can do at least 160 compounds a week. So it's not a very high throughput screen, but it's doable. And we should be able to get through, we're hoping, you know, somewhere around 2,000 compounds within a year or two years. And we've already had a little bit of success. I don't know for sure, but people were excited last time I was back at the lab. So I think this is going to be a really nice approach for us to identify compounds that could potentially be useful also for understanding UB3A function, but essentially could go to the clinic right away since they're already FDA approved in humans, and so you could use them off-label and potentially treat the seizure in this, this disorder. So um, I could go over a couple conclusions if I have time. Yep. Okay. Flies in, uh, endogenously express UB3A and glia, and that staining overlapped with ATP alpha. ATP alpha protein went down when we overexpressed UB3A and glial cells, confirming prior work that we did in neurons. Overexpression of UB3A and glia, but not neurons, results in a seizure susceptibility phenotype, and the glial specific knockdown of ATP alpha uh, produced a seizure phenotype and overexpression of ATP alpha in the repo UB3A background partially rescued the seizure phenotype, but not completely. Um, and so the, the data presented here essentially uh, says that ATP alpha and the regulation of potassium at the, at the, uh, at the synapse could be the underlying cause of seizures in, uh, in dupe 15 q syndrome, but we haven't obviously moved this into a mouse model. We would love for somebody to do that. Um, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not going to start up a mouse colony again. So um, I'm just happy with these results. And with that, I will um, thank the members of the lab, but specifically the Duke 15 q Alliance predoctoral fellow, Kevin Hope, who's going to give a talk tomorrow, who did all of this fly work and, you know, who I wouldn't be able to do this work without. So I thank all of you. And I'll remind you one more time that I have a dental pulp stem cell study in case you have a neurogenetic disorder you would like stem cells from, come talk to me later, and then I'll just leave this slide up with the acknowledgments and everything. Thanks. <laughs>